to attack the problem but not the person. We also express this particular part called attack and confess. One of the best ways to attack something is to confess you've had the problem. Use yourself as example one. Then use some others we call third party. Let me tell you about Mary. If Mary was here, she would confess, but she isn't here, so I'll confess for her. <laughs> she put it off. She had the problem. And if she was here, she might even try to persuade you with tears. Right? We call that third party. But one of the best is to use party one, called you, to attack the problems. Now, what are some of the things that need to be attacked? Let me just give you some examples. It's a pretty long list, but we'll have to just be sufficiently satisfied with a few, and you can continue these studies on your own. Procrastination. That's a good one, front and center. We've got to attack procrastination because it's so insidious. It eats up such large chunks of your life and leaves you in a small corner. Putting it off. Delaying. Letting it slide. Now, I'm one of the best to attack procrastination because I confess to being one of the all-time great procrastinators. I've done a lot of things, but I've put a lot of things off. <laughs> Procrastination. I am so good, I could teach it. Procrastination. I can show you how to do it so it don't show. I mean, I'm so good. I'm so good. But I also know the pain of procrastination. I also know the regret that comes from procrastination. I can also show you pieces of my life missing, never to be repaired, because I let it slide. Now see, if we all studied our own lives, and we we're trying to help somebody with this insidious disease of procrastination and putting it off, Front and center, we use ourselves as best example because you feel the strongest about your own experiences and your own emotions. Do you think you could help somebody with procrastination? Developing this skill of going back, rehearsing your own life and coming up with the essence of the emotion and the experience to try to illustrate to somebody how insidious it can become and how devastating it can leave your life and what will be missing if you let it slide. That's what we call learning to attack the problem. Now, underline the word attack. It's very important to go after the insidious. The great leader of the Christian says, The things I once hated, I now love. The things I once loved, I now hate. It's so important to incorporate both love and hate in the same conversation. Now, let me give you the dilemma. This stuff isn't easy. It's so easy to be careless with words and get the wrong reaction. What if you meant to say, what's troubling you? And instead you said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Can you imagine the difference? Just the mistake of one small word means all the difference in the world and the kind of reaction that you get. But here's the dilemma. To attack the problem, but not the person. God's got the same dilemma. God says, I love you, but I hate your sinful ways. Now, see, that's a challenge to show somebody that you love them, but you hate. How do you put love and hate in the same sentence? I'm telling you, it is essential to show your contempt for the problem and your concern for the value. These are not easy skills. You don't walk these summits of intellectual thought and word choice and emotional content and precision. You don't learn these overnight. But your commitment to excellence in communications can make all the difference in the world in how your economic and social and personal world works out. And here's part of the challenge. God says, I love you, but I hate your sinful ways. Now, since me and my sinful ways are bound up so close together, I tend to take that personal. <laughs> and God has to say, no, 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 let me make it clear one more time. I love you, but I hate your sinful ways. See, we've got to make that clear. You've got to make it clear to your children. I love you, but I hate what you're doing and what it's doing to you. So you've got to learn to put love and hate in the same sentence and to make the insidious as devastating and as ominous as it should be and make the opportunity as bright as it can be. But we've got to learn to paint by language and by emotions 
how much we hate the wrong in order to develop the good. And this is some stuff you can't be mild with. See, you can't take the mild approach to the weeds in your garden. You've got to hate weeds bad enough to go kill them. You say, well, I've learned to handle this stuff. This is not stuff you handle. This is stuff you devastate. This is stuff you've got to kill. If something is going after some treasure and some value, you've got to go after it with a high, hateful attempt by word, by language, by emotions, whatever is necessary to get the job done to illustrate the evil and the possibility of good. Now, these are not easy skills. But if you want to extend your reach, in my opinion, you just have to engage in the confrontation. It's where the values are. Let me give you a good philosophical phrase. All values must be won by contest. All values must be won by contest. And after they've been won, they must be defended. You say, wow, you've put a pretty heavy task on us. That's what life is all about, a pretty heavy challenge. We don't give large trophies for small effort. If you want to win high health, if you want to win high wealth, if you want to extend a long reach in touching people's lives, you got to engage in some of these extra powerful disciplines. And one is to secure the territory by vigor, and the other is to defend it with equal challenge. Attack. Procrastination. Here's another good one, blame. I engaged in this the big share of my life until I met Mr. Show. I used to blame my negative relatives. I used to blame the government. I used to blame taxes. I used to blame prices. I said, it costs too much. Show said, no, let's cover the real problem. You can't afford it. I thought, wow, I never looked at it like that before. Shof said, sir, you must intellectually understand, it's not it that's your problem. It's you that's your problem. It's not out there that's the problem. Out there is like it's been for 6,000 years. You can't cure that. But what you can cure is errors in judgment, errors in attitude, errors in activity, errors in misjudging results. I found that the errors were within. But see, he had to go after me on that point. Here's the next one. Excuses. Wow. We've got a million. I'm too short. I'm too tall. I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have the money. I don't have the experience. On and on and on with the excuses. Learning to attack. Very important. Now, here's what we call tools of last resort. Here's part of the attack you can use. And if you learn these skills, no telling who you can help. But you must save these for what we call tools of last, underline last resort. These are some things you don't use up front. Here's the first one, a direct attack. You've got to be very careful of a direct attack so that it not be misjudged in severity. Next is scolding. You've got to be very careful of scolding. You only use it as a last resort. Somebody walks in late and you say, where have you been? See, that's loaded with insinuations, loaded. You gotta be very careful, only use it as a last resort. If, if you have to resort to it, you have to, but don't use it up front. Okay, we call save these. Save these for when the occasion calls for such harsh language to go after something. And the last one is sarcasm. Sarcasm can be useful, but you gotta save it. Who do you think you are? See, that's powerful language, but you got to save it for when it is meaningful to use such powerful language. Matters of the heart are delicate. Here's what we teach. Don't operate on the heart with a hatchet. <laughs> when you use these tools, you got to be very careful to save the value and go after the problem. Now, let me give you the real clue. The more you care, the stronger you can be. People don't mind you using strong language about insidious things. They don't mind you becoming sharp, powerful, 
as long as you care, and the more you care, the stronger you can be. I don't mind a minister consigning my soul to hell fire for my sinful ways. I don't mind that, as long as he does it with tears and not with joy. <laughs> But wouldn't we all resist a dry-eyed sermon on hellfire? You can't preach hellfire without your heart breaking. You've got to sob your way through a sermon on hellfire. Or we all would resist a dry-eyed attempt to preach on hellfire. Why? A simple, obvious lack of really caring. And there are some subjects you cannot even deal with unless your heart breaks and unless visibly it shows by the emotional content that you really care. Now you can deal harshly with some powerful, important problems. Tools of last resort. Attacking the problems, but not the person. Just by way of review, we've been covering the major parts in a presentation, whether it's to a child or a business audience or a sales situation. All of us have the opportunity to affect somebody with words and we talked about making the presentation that comes in four parts. Number one, identification. Learning how to relate to somebody else, which is pretty easy if somebody's like you, pretty difficult if somebody's not like you. There's a difference in color, a difference in religion, a difference in age, a difference in uh, experience, background. It gets a little more complicated, but it can be mastered. And all you have to do is refine these skills to have a longer reach economically, socially, personally. Deal in subjects that make you real. Tell your story with authority. Next is the logic and reason part. Not too many facts. There's probably about a thousand facts about an automobile, but you don't need them all to make a decision. About a half a dozen will do. And if you stretch it beyond the half dozen, it's pretty easy to lose your audience. So, brief on logic and reason. Number three was learning to attack the problems, but not the person. Number four in making the presentation, solution. So we've got identification, logic, attacking the problems, and offering solution. This is what we call solutions, painting results in advance. This is an exciting part about the human experience, the ability to paint results in advance. We call it borrowing from the future. One of the reasons for living is to borrow from the future. If you can't see the future, it makes today pretty desperate. If you can't see the future, it makes your steps uncertain. Why bother to learn the skills and pay the price and go through all of the calisthenics and all of the trials of learning and growing and changing if you can't see the future? If there is no future, if there is no promise. So this is one of our great challenges to do two things. One, paint for ourselves the future results in advance borrowing from the future. But when you stop to think about it, that is a tremendous unique experience, being able to borrow from the future, bring it to the present, and use it as an incentive to go get the job done, to learn the skills and put those skills to work. So painting results in advance, whether it's money results, whether it's position results, possibilities, opportunities, putting the person you're talking to in the future position, I can see you now, solutions. And it can be very powerful, very powerful. What makes the farmer work all spring and toil all summer? His vision of the harvest. If he couldn't see the harvest, he wouldn't put the plow in the ground. If he couldn't visualize the opportunity, the chance to cash in and to turn wheat into money and money into lifestyle, if he couldn't see all of this, why would you put the plow to the soil? And the answer is, of course, why? If you can't see, why labor? And if the promise isn't clear, why put out the effort?